whenever you're ready, Mr. Jokwin. Thank you, Daniel. Um, first off, good morning, everybody, and welcome um, to the webinar on economic substance. By way of quick introduction, um, as Daniel said, I'm Kenneth Jokwin, the Registrar of Companies. I'm joined today by Ms. Ann Daniels, who's the Head of Compliance, and Mr. Michael Frith, who is the Economic um, Advisor for the Registrar of Companies. Uh, we wanted to have this webinar, <coughs> excuse me, now that we've got a full year of economic substance filings under our belt, and we're starting to see the trends and, and noticing the issues that industry have raised. So we wanted to take this time to update you on the process uh, and where we're at. Um, we know that you've had challenges or some people have had challenges um, with respect to the ES filing system. So we'd like to thank you for your patience. There are still some technical teething issues that we are obviously aware of and we're working, working our way through. Um, you may recall that in earlier outreach sessions, we had talked about upgrades to the economic substance portal. Um, I just wanted to let you know, those are still, still happening and still underway. Um, we're, we're being very deliberate and measured about how we approach um, those adjustments to the portal. Uh, one of the key driving factors in that has been the evolving um, economic substance framework as, as we become more aware of it and the OECD outlines the parameters and the expectations that they expect the economics um, framework um, to operate under. And so as a consequence, we've been um, more deliberate in how we do the system and how we do rollouts until we get to that, that comfort spot between us as the jurisdiction and the OECD as obviously the overseeing regulatory uh, body. Uh, the e-registration system has also rolled out in parallel. Um, and there's obviously some overlap between the e-registration system and the economic substance portal um, as we merge the two systems. Um, some of you will be aware that we are intending to do an e-registration um, system working group, <coughs> excuse me. And although we haven't formalized one as yet for the economic substance um, portal system, um, we will be looking at those things um, as the process um, evolves. Uh, that said, um, so I'd like to thank you for your patience for us, with us so far. Um, and I'd like to hand it over now to Ms. Daniels, the head of compliance, to take you through um, the agenda you see before you. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, as we get started, I'd just like to, um, just a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, you can ask questions at any time by typing them in on the Q&A um, session that's here. Please don't ask entity specific questions. Um, um, we don't, those, those are not things that we want to um, address here. Um, after the presentation by Michael, I will open up the questions to anyone who has topics, has questions on the, the topics that he's discussed or any inter interpretation questions. Um, George and I, George is not here. So please don't ask any questions that are specific to the system. George is our guru. We, we, we miss him terribly, but uh, I, I am not George and I'm not equipped to answer those questions. I will, however, ask, answer questions that, um, that we are aware of that are specific with to the economic substance filings, okay? Um, I, we will endeavor to answer all the questions during the um, session, but if there are questions we do not answer, we are trying to put together an FAQ um, uh, uh, session that you can, um, that people can look at and, and see if there are questions that they have that are represented there. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Michael to address some of the interpretation issues we've seen. Okay, thank you, Anne. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, just wanted to go through um, a few fairly broad um, interpretation questions that we've seen um, come up. There, there's nothing, I don't think anyway, there's nothing revolutionary or new um, in these interpretations, but, but what the compliance team has observed um, through the process is that um, there have been occasions where um, entities have uh, misinterpreted, misunderstood um, the, the, you know, these particular um, uh, terms, particular definitions. So as you see on the agenda there, there, there are four broad topics that, that I'll go through. One is just addressing um, or discussing the, the definition of pure equity holding entities. The other is local entities. Um, we'll also talk about non-resident entities, um, specifically in the context of the application of um, the, the tax transparency analysis that appears in the guidance notes. 
uh, and then a brief discussion about entities in liquidation um, and by extension also um, entities that have been liquidated um, and or have discontinued um, uh, from Bermuda um, and no longer exist on the register. So I'll start with pure equity holding entities. Um, and the, the reason we're bringing this one up is just because there seems to have been some uh, confusion regarding the, the general concept of holding entity. So, so everyone knows what that is, you know, investment holdings, holding companies, holding entities um, as, a, as a commercial concept is well understood. That is a principal business activity that can be selected when filling out your annual um, declaration under the Companies Act, for example. Um, but that does not mean necessarily anyway, um, that the entity is a pure equity holding entity as defined in the Economic Substance Act. Um, the pure equity holding entity definition um, and therefore the, the application of the reduced um, uh, economic substance requirements in respect to pure equity holding entities, that definition is very specific. Um, and the, there are a couple of key elements to it. Um, the first is that the pure equity holding entity must hold a controlling stake in one or more controlling equity stake in one or more other entities. Um, so if minority stake is held or it's a debt interest, for example, um, th that will not bring it into scope um, as a pure equity holding entity. It's just if there are one or more controlling equity positions um, in uh, one or more other entities. The other key part of the definition, and this is the one that um, seems to have tripped a few um, entities up, is that the pure equity holding entity, in addition to holding a controlling stake, um, controlling equity stake, must carry on no other commercial activity. Um, and if the entity is carrying on another commercial activity, and that commercial activity is a relevant activity, for example, um, a pure equity holding entity uh, with intergroup loans, um, which would constitute the relevant activity of financing and leasing, that the entity will be in scope for that relevant activity, not as a pure equity holding entity, because that is another commercial activity. If the commercial activity is not a relevant activity, then the entity will be out of scope altogether. Um, very broadly speaking, um, and, and this isn't specifically defined, but the, the way that we understand it anyway is um, other commercial activity would generally be interpreted as you know, any revenue um, being earned from a, a, another activity, you know, whatever that happens to be. If that's the case, it takes it out of scope. So as I say, very important that those two key elements of the definition are met in order for it to be a pure equity holding entity that is controlling equity stake um, in one or more other entities and carries on no other commercial activity. Um, if there are no specific questions on that, at least not at this stage, um, I will then move on to uh, discussion of local entities. This is another one where, because there's a kind of a broad understanding of what a local company is, what a local LLC, et cetera, is under the, the, the sort of existing um, Companies Act um, uh, regime, there is a presumption or seems anyway to be a presumption that that therefore means that you're a local entity for the purpose of the Economic Substance Act. Um, and that is not quite correct. Uh, as with pure equity holding entity, local entity as a defined term under the Economic Substance Act has a very specific meaning. And it has three elements. The first element is that it must be a local company, LLC or partnership. Um, that is subject to the majority of the 60, subject to the 60-40 rule, um, or in the case of a partnership, has no Bermudian partners. So where you have a local company, um, if, it, uh, if it is required to meet the 60-40 the um, Bermudian ownership and control requirement, um, or if it's a partnership, has no Bermudian partners, it will meet that first element of the definition. If it is exempted from you know, has a 114B license, for example, is exempted from the 6040 requirement, um, or, or that's varied in, in some way, then it would not meet that first element of the definition. So that's element number one. The second element is that it must carry on business only in Bermuda. Um, so if it, for example, had um, a branch operating elsewhere, um, that would also take it out of scope. So 
must be subject to the you know a local company or LLC or partnership that is subject to the Bermudian ownership and control requirements must be carrying on business only in Bermuda. And, and this is the one that um, we found has, has tripped a few entities up, and it must not be part of an MNE group. An MNE group itself has a very specific definition. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the um, country by country um, reporting regulations, um, you'll be familiar with the concept of an MNE group in that context. And the economic substance definition is very similar to that. In fact, it's identical in every respect but one. And that is the, the 750 million euro revenue threshold. So under the CBC regs, you're only part of an ME group if the group um, has greater than 750 million euros of revenue. Um, under the economic substance definition, there is no revenue threshold. And effectively what that means is if the Bermuda company the local Bermuda company has one or more affiliates outside of Bermuda, tax resident outside of Bermuda, or operates a branch that is tax resident outside of Bermuda, it will be deemed to be part of an m and &E group. So, so just having one affiliate that is tax resident outside of Bermuda would, would bring you into scope of an m and &E group, which takes you out of scope of the definition of local entity. Um, as I say, that and so you have to look very carefully, entities need to look very carefully at that definition and don't assume that just because you are a local company, for example, um, under the Companies Act, that you necessarily meet the local entity definition uh, under the Economic Substance Act. Um, just see whether there's any questions. Um, see, there, there are a couple which we'll deal with. Um, Actually, this, this one's worth dealing with. Um, I see there's a question, if the company is a holding entity and they receive a dividend, um, but they also have royalty income, um, presume, which presumably um, would, uh, would be um, intellectual property royalty income, will that take it into scope of intellectual property? Does materiality play a role? The last question is um, fairly straightforward. Uh, materiality does not play a role. Um, if you are earning any revenue at all from a relevant activity, you will be in scope for that relevant activity. That, that much is very clear. Um, so in that, in that circumstance, if that holding entity was also earning IP income, um, that would, on the face of it at least, um, bring it into scope for intellectual property um, as a relevant activity, and it would not be a pure equity holding entity. Um, the other question I think I'll deal with uh, towards the end. Um, I'll move on uh, for the time being just on to non-resident entity, talk about that a bit. Um, broadly speaking, this is uh, a, a topic that has been of great interest, unsurprisingly, um, since we first um, uh, introduced it as a concept last year. Non-resident entity, as a reminder, um, is an entity that can demonstrate that all of its income from a relevant activity is liable to tax in a jurisdiction outside of Bermuda, that being a non-blacklisted jurisdiction. Um, so where, the, and the principle here is, um, fundamentally, if an entity, um, the income from its relevant activity is liable to tax in a taxable jurisdiction, it should not be required to meet economic substance requirements in Bermuda. Um, so that's a, that's a reminder generally, that is the principle at play. That's the reason for the, for the, for the concept in the legislation. Um, and by extension, uh, the, 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 and the guidance notes do discuss this briefly, the concept of a tra tax transparent entity and what that means is where you have an entity where all of the income from its relevant activity is attributable to one or more of its owners, partners, shareholders, um, and those partners are liable to tax in a jurisdiction outside of Bermuda. So rather than the entity itself being liable to tax, all of its income is attributable to owners that are themselves liable to tax. And if you are able to provide evidence of, number one, the fact that the, the, um, all of the income from relevant activity is attributable to those owners, um, and you can evidence that those owners are liable to tax in that jurisdiction, then you will, that will be sufficient evidence to, to demonstrate that the entity is a non-resident entity. It's particularly relevant in the partnership context, context which we're aware of. 
um, uh, and and for those partnerships that may have been brought into scope with the changes to the um, to those definitions earlier this year, um, it, it, it's something to, to bear in mind. But the key principle, um, and, and this comes up quite a lot, is that it must be all of the income from the relevant activity has to be demonstrably liable to tax in that overseas jurisdiction. If it's only a portion of it, um, then that would not constitute the entity a non-resident entity. Um, so, so that evidence needs to be provided. And, and the, the guidance notes address the, in, at least in general terms, the form that that evidence must take and where that evidence um, should be provided from. Um, so if any questions about that, please add them to the, to the Q&A. Um, otherwise, I'll move on to uh, discuss entities in liquidation. Um, it's another one that, that seems to have come up um, a fair bit. Where an entity, and the, the guidance notes again do address this briefly, um, but where an entity is in liquidation but has not yet been liquidated, if it is in liquidation, then it remains subject to the Economic Substance Act. Um, and where the liquidator has been appointed and has assumed responsibility for the company from the directors, the, those liquidate, the liquidator will be responsible for ensuring that the Economic Substance Declaration, if one is required, um, is filed and filed on time. So the, the only point at which the, the obligation to comply with economic substance and to make a filing under the Economic Substance Act, the only point at which that ceases is when the company ceases to exist. So at the point that it is in fact wound up um, and also in the context of um, not, not relevant to liquidations, but where a company may have discontinued from the jurisdiction no longer exists in Bermuda, um, it would uh, no longer be subject to the Economic Substance Act and no longer required to file. But for so long as the entity is in liquidation and continues to, to operate, um, if it, it's subject to the Economic Substance Act, so if it's carrying on a relevant activity, um, it remains liable to file. Um, so those are the, the broad topics that um, I wanted to uh, cover um, here. The, uh, I see there's a question, liquidation completes after the relevant period, but before the reporting deadline, is entity still not subject to submitting an ESD? Um, the, the answer to that technically is yes, that is correct. Um, if the company no longer exists, it is not required to file. Um, uh, it is, doesn't change the fact though that um, the entity must have been in compliance um, throughout that period. So it doesn't preclude the registrar from taking action in the event that he becomes aware or the compliance team becomes aware that the entity was not in compliance for the period that it did exist. Um, and, and, you know, at least conceivably, it could be restored to the register in order for action to be taken in that regard. So it shouldn't be seen as a circumvention, but technically speaking, once the company doesn't exist, it's no longer subject to the, um, subject to the legislation. Um, this is a, yeah, this is, I see there's a question about, again, about pure equity holding entities. If a holding entity has two investments and no other activities, um, one is a controlling investment, the other is a minority investment. The question is, is the holding entity out of scope? That is a good question. Um, I have to admit there's no clear answer to it. Um, and I think broadly speaking, you, you, you need to look at the, at, the, at the wording of the legislation, which talks about um, the, the primary function um, of the entity being to hold a controlling stake. So if I can put it in, in broad terms, and to be clear, this, is, this should not be taken as a, as, a, as a threshold analysis, but if the controlling stake is the larger interest, you know, it is more significant in value in terms of dividend income, et cetera, that should be the defining characteristic. But if the, the minority interest is the bigger interest and the controlling stake is a very minor part of what the, what the entity does, um, it is at least conceivable that that would not be a, a pure equity holding entity. But to be clear, there is no, um, uh, there is no threshold analysis here. There's no, uh, if, if you have this percentage, you're in scope, if you have that percentage, you're not. Um, you just need to take a, a, a sensible, a reasonable approach, applying the guidance notes in good faith. Um, and if you have questions about your particular entity, um, raise those with the registrar. Um, right. I, I don't see any other specific interpretation questions. 
So on that note, I will hand back over to, uh, to Anne. I'll just finish by saying, um, if anyone does have any further questions, please don't hesitate to put them up. We'll endeavor to answer them um, before the end of the session. But otherwise, Anne, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I'll start um, addressing this with um, uh, system issues. Um, I know that some of you have had issues in trying to file your economic substance declaration. A couple of reasons for this. Um, if you've done everything that you are, are supposed to do regarding accessing the, um, <coughs> sorry, the e-registry system, and um, then, then you are in the clear and you still can't do your ESD, then, then there's another problem. Generally, we are aware of the, of the issues that um, are causing people not to be able to file once you have done the, done the correct, gotten the correct authorizations. Um, generally, these are um, for entities with multi-currency shares, say C sales and ISACs, and a few entities failed to come over um, as we migrated the information from um, AS400 into Catalyst. So there are only a few of these entities. Uh, we believe we are aware of all of them, um, but if you um, uh, fall under this any of these categories and you have not let us know um, previously, please let us um, know now. Um, we are advised that the issue with multi-currency share entities should be resolved when um, George comes back. The other issues will probably be resolved prob later in October. What we have done and what we are doing is for those entities who aren't able to file from systemic issue, system issues, we are arranging for them to make paper filings. Um, they, there is no, there can be no penalty for them filing late because we cannot penalize you for issues that are, are ours. However, if none of these issues apply to you, you and you haven't filed um, then on time, then you will be adjudicated as having a late filing. Um, it's a six month period from the year end to file and notwithstanding system issues, there should be, that should be plenty of time to, to make the, the declaration. Access to the economic substance declaration. Um, um, it's, it's interesting. Um, with the go live of the registry, um, access to the economic substance declaration is is through the through the e-registry system. Previous to this, um, while the e-registry was be, still being developed, we had to do a standalone authorization to be able to access and and, and file ESDs. Now that the system is fully developed or uh, has gone live, the ESD is a filing under the e-registry system. So if you have access to the e-registry system, you have access to the economic substance declaration. Um, accordingly, we are really um, being careful about making sure that that access is carefully controlled. Um, we would hate for somebody to be able to access information um, on an economic substance declaration that they should not have access to because it is sensitive and propriety and personal information. Um, accordingly, we are doing a retroactive 100% verification of the authorization. Um, some of you will have already received a request to provide authorization documents. What we're looking for here is um, uh, the document that you authorizes you, that the entity has, has, has put in place that authorizes a corporate service provider or another person to, um, uh, to act on their behalf with the registrar of companies. Um, Generally, these are service agreements, um, uh, could be resolutions, depending on the, the structure of the entity and, and whether it's a licensed CSP or, or a corporate secretary that's operating for a group. Um, but we are looking for these agreements or some evidence from the entity authorizing the corporate service provider to act on its behalf. Um, I do understand that some service agreements are of some age. Um, I believe there is an expectation that service agreements will be um, um, will be um, uh, 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 kind of not as specific to include details about um, what uh, the corporate service provider will do with regard to um, uh, the the filings, making filings. However, um, we are aware of that um, and 
don't think that you will be penalized for that, but we do encourage um, everyone to take a look at their service agreements uh, in accordance with the, uh, the, the, the court code of conduct for corporate service providers. And generally, um, you want to be able to demonstrate that you have given proper authorization and also that you can hold your corporate service provider accountable for what you are expecting they do. You don't want to have circumstances where you, the entity is expecting this CSP has done something and the CSP hasn't done it and the agreement does not speak to it. Okay, so please, uh, it's an awful lot. So we are doing 100% um, um, verification. Um, so it will take some time, um, um, but um, it's not trying to catch out. Um, we just want to be sure that we have, have the proper authorization and that your information is protected from others. I see a question here. It says to address risk, security risk and considering private sensitive info, info in the portal, can the ROC portal be updated to enable a user to, to immediately revoke access granted incorrectly due to human error and, and avoid the lag time when an email is sent to the ROC and the ROC, ROC revolving access? No, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it, it's important that when you, this is why we are we are careful, and that one that um, that we are authorizing only people who are authorized correctly. We cannot be responsible for your errors. So if you need something revoked, you need to you need to do it as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, I've got a question here on filing. Previously, when an economic substance declaration was filed, you would revise a confirmation, we would receive, I'm assuming, a confirmation email from the registrar. We haven't received any confirmations for filings that were made on or before 6th of August. Is this something we can expect? Um, as you will be aware, we have extended the deadline for the submission of ESDs because of our system issues. Um, the part that was not disabled in the system is the part that uh, we, we, what we disabled in the system is the notice that would be sent to you saying that you had filed late. Um, there is uh, whenever uh, an, 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 a filing is made after the filing deadline, then the acknowledgement of that filing is not completed until a technical officer within the compliance team has actually uh, acknowledged the receipt of it and reviewed it. Um, so that you will be getting, um, that has not been disabled. Um, we didn't think it was that important, but you will be receiving, um, not be receiving at, um, notification of your acceptance. If you really, really require um, notification or confirmation that we have received it, you can uh, write us and one of the technical officers will, um, will, will um, compliance officers will send you a, a response. Uh, check, the, the, check the portal and make sure that it's there. Um, but yeah, the, the, that's something that is a system issue that we didn't disable when we, we, we extended the um, filing point. Uh, there's a question here on public directors register. That is a question for the registration team. Um, we'll, and you, we can refer that to them. <sighs> Sorry, Ann, just I'll give you a, a bit of a break there. Um, I see there's a, a, a question um, just relating to uh, dealing with COVID related restrictions and, and how the registrar um, is addressing those. I'm happy to um, to take a stab at that. The way the question was phrased is, is there any leeway or light touch proposed for where companies have found it difficult to get people on island, et cetera, being called off island due to COVID restrictions? Um, I think it's probably not correct to say that there will be a leeway or a light touch proposed, um, but that does not mean that the registrar does not um, very explicitly understand the um, current restrictions that are imposed as a result of um, travel and quarantine restrictions as a result of COVID. Um, and broadly speaking, um, we'll take that into account. And there, there was an industry notice to that effect um, right at the beginning of the pandemic last year, saying that they, the registrar will take that into account, is able to take that into account in the overall analysis, recognizing that the entity must nonetheless um, continue to comply with the economic substance requirements generally um, uh, and, and the guidance notes in that context. So 
for example, sort of managing and directing requirement or the managed and directed in Bermuda requirement if directors are unable to travel to Bermuda but would ordinarily do so, um, that can be taken into account. What is less likely to be um, uh, given credit for is where the core income generating activity is unable to be performed in Bermuda as a result of, of someone being unable to travel to the island. That's something the Red Shore will, will take a slightly harder look at. The key point in all of it though, is ensure that you've got records um, there to substantiate the basis on which you, you, you know, the, the individuals in question are unable to travel um, and, and the reason for the, the inability to meet. It shouldn't be seen as a carte blanche. We don't need to worry about it. It's, you, you do need to be able to substantiate your position um, in relation to the COVID restrictions. If you're able to do that, broadly speaking, the registrar, um, I expect we'll, we'll take it into appropriate account. Thank you, Michael. Uh, just one other system issue we, we, we are aware of is the document limit. Uh, currently, there's an inability to upload more than one document to the ES portal. Um, we recognize this until it's addressed. Um, we encourage to um, provide additional documents that you would have filed with your ESD uh, by sending us a note to the ROC compliance email box. Please don't send it anywhere else. Um, that's the box that gets checked by the compliance team. And we, we look there for anything that, that comes from entities. Um, sending it to individuals is risky because they may be out, may forget about it. Um, but please use the ROC compliance bo email box for anything that you wish to supply us with. So I'll move on now to filing issues, things we've seen um, from the declarations that have been filed. One of the major things that I mean, I, I, I've, I've, we've noticed is that entities have come back and people have come back and asked, said that um, we, oh, we, we press submit and we, we want to make a change to the filing. We, it's something was filed. We, we didn't check it or we filed something in error that I think it was an error, but we've already pressed submit. Once the submit button is pressed, the declaration is submitted. It is a binding legal document and it cannot be changed. So please, please, please check the document um, several times before you press that submit button because you cannot retract it, okay? Um, if you've made an error before you press submit, you can go and change it any, at, at any point. You can save and change the document all you like before you press submit. So we encourage using that save and checking on a constant basis before you press submit. What to do if you've submitted an ESD with errors? If you press that submit button and you realize it's got errors, what do you do? Um, you notify us as soon as possible through the ROC compliance email box. Um, we don't encourage you to use this on a frequent basis because we want the ESDs to be um, properly submitted. Um, but if you have you filed it and you notice there's something that oh, somebody forgotten to, to correct, um, that's the way you can notify us, okay? Um, additional information. Sometimes there's information that um, is important to the filing that the entity feels is important for the registrar to know. Um, if you have that and it's not represented in any of the fields, now you, you recognize that we will be adding fields to the declaration um, as we make the upgrades. But until then, um, if there's something that you think is important to the assessment that you need us to know, you can use the notes field. The notes field is uh, has has character limits. I think it's a thousand. I'm not. Um, positive, but I th it, it is, has limits. So this field is not for any and all information that you want us to know. It is for spe specific information you think is necessary for the R registrar to um, have in order to assess the return. Um, so be sure to use that when you need to, but use it very judiciously. We are looking at getting, as part of the upgrade, increasing the, the, the character limit in that field. Um, another thing that we've noticed, um, which is, is a little disturbing, is where people will have completed the um, declaration and in the declaration they will have said they have no FTEs, they don't outsource, and they have no premises. And at the end of the declaration they will say they have complied with economic substance obligations. That's a false declaration, truthfully. Um, 
if you have failed to meet one element of economic substance obligation, you have failed economic substance. Um, you, uh, if you don't comply with one or more of the economic substance requirements, then you're not in compliance. Please be sure to, to check your um, filing to make sure that you understand that. Uh, another issue that we've come across is where we have an entity that is conducting more than one relevant activity, but one of the activities has nil gross revenue. What we found is that uh, in these cases, if you, if the first and the first activity you report on is the one that has the nil uh, gross revenue, then the system will not allow you to put in the information for the other, other relevant activity which you actually do have revenue for. Um, we are aware of this. If you have more than one activity and one of them has nil active, no, no gross revenue, please first document the activity that does have revenue and in the notes section let us know that you have another activity relevant activity but it has generated no revenue for the year for the relevant period um, and and we will then revert to you and, and get more information as as necessary um, but that that is one issue we are aware of and again as we do the upgrade we will address that issue we don't think there are too many of them but if you have come across that um, there is a there is a fix for that um, I think, and lastly, uh, I think um, uh, Michael touched on evidence of tax residency. I know this has become an issue for some um, where um, you are required to um, uh, file to um, uh, to ensure that you are tax resident. You make a filing to say, yes, I'm tax resident, but the country does not require an actual filing of a tax return unless certain conditions are met. I think this is uh, generally in Hong Kong, you have to meet certain thresholds, et cetera. So what, so what, what the entity will have is saying, yes, the Hong Kong has said I'm tax resident uh, when I registered in the country, but they will have nothing that says that they have uh, they have filed tax for the relevant period that we are we are reviewing. Um, in these instances, what we're looking for is actual evidence of um, uh, failing to meet the thresholds. So if you are an entity that is registered for tax in, in a jurisdiction but can provide no evidence of filing a tax return in the relevant period, uh, and it's because for valid reasons you haven't met certain thresholds, you will need to provide us with the information that, that says we have not filed this year because we didn't meet these thresholds, these are the thresholds that are required, et cetera, et cetera. So just provide us the detail of, of, of why you have not filed a tax return and proof that you met the conditions. Um, if you are tax resident in a jurisdiction that is on a blacklist, that is not evidence that that is not uh, acceptable tax residency and you will have you will be um, deemed non-compliant. Um, we have come across instances where uh, an entity is registered in, an, in a jurisdiction that was initially blacklisted and during the review period uh, was removed from the blacklist at the residency is at the time of the filing. So if you're a resident for tax purposes in a non-blacklisted jurisdiction um, at, and uh, at, the, at, at the year end, then, but it was blacklisted partway through the, through the review period, that, that's okay. Um, you are not a, in a blacklisted jurisdiction as at the filing period. Uh, I have a question here. Last year, 2019, ESDs, we received requests for supplemental information. Information request was not included in the 2020 ESD. Is the RSE expecting to use supplemental information requests this year? Yes. Um, again, the, the goal is to collect all information through the um, economic substance portal. However, um, uh, we are being very judicious in our use of resources and we, we were making those changes uh, as much as possible at one time rather than making them piecemeal. Um, so it is likely that you may receive some supplemental questionnaires, um, but as we have a little more experience under our, our belt this year, they may change, they may be different, but um, until we have changed the portal, um, we will most likely be sending out any supplemental questionnaires. 
I think that is all I have um, at this time of things that we have seen, the, the, the compliance team has seen, and our system issues. Um, again, I just want to uh, say that the FAQ links will be updated and you'll be advised when that has happened. Um, uh, any questions that haven't been answered here will be answered uh, through the FAQ um, as, as much as possible. Um, and again, we are, uh, we, we are we're happy to receive um, um, your input um, as to things you have seen that haven't been mentioned here and issues that you've come across that have not been resolved here. Um, and so unless there are other questions. Um, and and there, there, there is one question um, yes. that came up just as a, as a, a something that will follow on from my comments earlier, just in relation to the holding of meetings. And I, and I do think it'd be worth um, addressing because it has a much broader application. Mm -hmm. the, the, the question is, is a meeting deemed to be held in Bermuda if the chairman and a quorum is present in Bermuda, but other directors are not? Um, so my, my sort of standard answer to that is the name of the game is substance. Um, uh, and it's important to bear that in mind when considering questions like that. So it's not a question of form. Um, it is a question of substance. The requirement under the Economic Substance Act is that the entity be managed and directed in Bermuda. Um, so if, for example, you had a board of, let's say, seven directors, um, one of those was in Bermuda, um, and uh, or, or two were in Bermuda and the quorum is two and you held a meeting, could you say from that that the entity therefore meets the requirement to be managed and directed in Bermuda, notwithstanding the fact that there are five other directors um, who are not located in Bermuda either generally or at the time of the meeting? Um, and the answer, very broadly speaking, will be probably not. Um, uh, so you do need to look at the, the, the question is, is the entity managed and directed in Bermuda, not the question of does it meet a quorum requirement in Bermuda? Um, and that's related. There's, there was another question about, um, I mean, the specific question was whether, how does the BMA view the use of proxies in light of travel restrictions? Um, I presume the, the reference to BMA um, is in relation to the, meant to say the ROC. Certainly we can only answer um, for the purpose of the ROC, but the, the use of proxies, likewise, um, you know, the appointment of an alternate director, the use of a proxy um, for meetings, um, you know, you have to look at whether substantively the, the entity would um, meet the managed and directed requirement and, and possibly by extension, the, the core income generating activities being performed in Bermuda um, requirement, not, not the technicalities um, under the bylaws as to whether or not a meeting a meeting is validly held. It's to say it's not a it's not a technical form question. It's very much a substance question. So look at the economic substance requirement, not the not the technical requirements. There's another question here, Michael. Can we count UWRs as meetings if a company has a sole director? But if if a company has a sole director but does UWRs rather than live meetings, it's much of a muchness, really. Yeah, so again, the, the question is not one of, of form, it's a question of substance. So if that director was not located in Bermuda um, and, and signed a UWR, I don't think by any measure you could argue that that, that, that action, that management and direction took place in Bermuda. Um, if the director is located in Bermuda and is otherwise attending to the affairs of the company in Bermuda while resident in Bermuda or, or, or deals with the issues in Bermuda, the signing of a UWR is to put it bluntly, neither here nor there. Um, the, the, isn't it, it doesn't matter negatively or positively. Again, it's a question of substance, not form. Um, so it's not the taking of the action that is the question. It's, it's whether that action and the other actions around it are, are being performed in Bermuda. Um, so so don't, don't think of UWRs as a way of, of, of technically addressing a, a managed and directed requirement. It, it should be a meeting, generally. Thank you, Michael. I see I've got one question here that is actually a very good question. It says companies that received notice letters for non-compliance for previous period and provided a response to the ROC, when can they expect to receive responses from the ROC? Thank you. We are now, um, we have, we're attempting now to, to do the full assessment of the 2019 returns. Um, it is, 
a massive undertaking. Um, we've got systems that need to be developed in order to make this more efficient. We are, so as we are progressing, what we've done is start to address this using on a kind of a batch mechanism, using different buckets of, of, of homogeneous um, returns to, um, to, to deal with at, at, on a, on a, on a, batch basis. So you will have seen certain entities will have seen action on their returns, others will not. Um, it is, um, it is, uh, it is a, a long process. And um, yeah, you, we are, we are moving forward as quickly as we can. Um, but as, as a, it's, it's done the batch mechanism so that don't think that we are not looking at you if we just because you haven't received a response. Um, the goal is once we have finalized the review of the, the assessment of the 2019 return, um, that we'll be able to, um, where appropriate, um, have responded to everybody who, um, as, who has made a filing. And a question here, did I hear that the RSC is, is making the full assessment of 2019? Yes, um, the economic substance uh, expectations are that uh, it is the ROC registrar who determines whether an entity is compliant. You can make a filing that says, yes, I'm compliant, uh, but is for the registrar to assess whether it's compliant or not. And assessment is, is uh, compliance is only done at that level. Um, so yes, we are reviewing the 2019 returns and um, with you to ex ensuring um, that we meet our obligations under the act. Um, I don't see any other questions, so um, uh, if there are none, oh. again, I think, yeah, I think there's another question that's asking about directors, and I think, um, I think Michael has, has been very clear, it's not about numbers and things like that, it's about what actually occurs in Bermuda, what is being determined, um, what decisions are being made here. Yeah, I mean, you know, the literal answer to the question is, does to the question of does appointing a director of Bermuda assist with ES compliance? The answer is, of course, yes, it assists, but it is not the only answer. Yes. Um, so, so it is, it is as Anne said, it's a question of substance. So. One one of the other things that I would like to let you know is that um, uh, I've seen some some people have filed remedial actions and they it appeared that they were waiting for our approval of those remedial actions before they made their 2020 filings. Um, we, it is not, how can I say this? We will not, please do not rely on us to approve uh, remedial actions before you make your filing. It's your responsibility is to make your filing. Again, the, the action taken to remediate non-compliance is something that again will be assessed by the registrar for adequacy, but um, it is it is it should not be something that would delay your um, your filing because it is not it is a decision that should be taken by the entity as to what adequacy looks like. Thanks, Anne. And, and that actually addresses the, the, the question that's come up. The question is, if numbers are not important, then why do we need to provide numbers for most questions? Um, putting aside the slightly argumentative nature of that question, um, the reason for the numbers is because there needs to be a relative um, analysis of what the company has and what the company does. So looking at the number of directors that are resident in Bermuda relative to the total number of directors will aid in the analysis as to whether or not the entity is managed and directed in Bermuda, as an example. So, so the numbers are certainly important. The, nothing in the answers that I gave previously should be taken as um, a, a, an assessment that the numbers are not critical. The point is, it is not a technical bright line analysis. It's always a relative analysis in the context of the nature, scale, and complexity of that company. Um, and so the, the data is necessary to conduct that analysis. Um, we need to know numbers of meetings, numbers of directors, et cetera, in order, to, in order for the compliance team to conduct that analysis. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I see no more questions. And accordingly, I'll turn it over to Ken to close out. Okay, well, first off, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Anne. Um, another useful conversation. Um, just a, a final note to the industry for, for issues that we did not cover related to economic substance and 
um, you would like to go over. We remain receptive, so please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to have those conversations and have that continued engagement as we um, develop the economic substance framework. Um, and again, I'd like to say, as I said in the beginning, thank you for your patience as we work through um, some of the glitches and transitional issues as we implement this regime. Um, and we look forward to, um, to being of continued service. So on that note, thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you. Bye-bye.